Uh, we have uh, Angela Tenenbrock, who's going to be talking to us about biosecurity uh, and food safety protocols and, and those types of considerations. Uh, if you're ever looking for an expert that uh, can kind of come in and do an audit of your facility, making sure that you're going to be able to pass those inspections when those inspectors come to make, uh, she is definitely one of the best people to talk to. And um, she has a lot of experience working on all different manners of agriculture um, uh, in aquaponics, uh, as well as uh, uh, other things. So um, she really is a, a, an expert on all different types of stuff. So she's going to be talking to us today about bacteria as well. Uh, so um, uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. All right, all right, all right. How are we doing today? I uh, coming in here from sunny Florida, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, begin my presentation with a little bit of uh, information that's uh, not in the cannabis uh, space, but nonetheless, it's in the aquaponics space, and it lets us be able to uh, cross pollinate, so to speak. Ha ha. Um, some of the stuff that we all do. So remember, my favorite thing to say is, if one of us fails, everyone fails. So. Uh, I'm here today to uh, bring some light to the things that we need to do. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some bacteria. Today, I tell people that today I'm going to open my vest because Victor is coming behind me. And uh, Victor's been on my farm. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit in tandem about some um, plant probiotics and uh, stuff like that, that kind of is interesting to everyone in our space, both uh, aquaponics, hydroponics, and um, as we move into dirt because I, I believe that aquaponics holds the key to carbon uh, sequestration and regeneration. So here we go. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, Steve, um, a little bit. Uh, here we go. Ready for me? Yep, go ahead. All right. Of course, it's gonna say try it. So let's go back. <laughs> Man, oh man, oh man, here we go. Start from here. All right, so I'm Angela Tenbrook uh, and we like to talk about Farmgate Fresh. Um, we uh, run uh, Aquahortis Farms. So Aquahortis is our company that uh, helps you uh, own, operate and develop your farms, SOPs, your food safety protocols. Um, we like to talk about Farmgate Fresh and the approach to solve food insecurity. Uh, and you know, cannabis is in the food space, so we have to think about the ways in which we do things as we grow and grow and grow and do better things. So this is our idea for uh, bringing food to the masses so we can do um, you know, food in different kinds of ways. So we have, uh, we all know that aquaponics is four times more efficient, half the cost, and uses 50% less energy and 90% uh, less water. We have a longer shelf life um, and our foods and materials are more nutritious. So um, we believe that we can actually, in the future, we will have um, farms, both cannabis and food uh, everywhere because cannabis is our nutrition. And as, as we grow and move forward, we can push hyper-local uh, opportunities that connects uh, communities with local food, um, smoke, uh, eat, and employment. Um, and we believe that radically simplifying farming by using collaborations, education, and partnerships, such as you have this rock star group from Potent Ponics putting on these kinds of free uh, opportunities to be able to learn as we move forward. Um, and we believe that uh, as we legalize uh, in the United States and around the world, uh, stuff will become, we'll see what we call re-emerging citizens to be able to grow our food. And this becomes a social justice issue because people will now be able to become non-criminal. So uh, as we progress and move forward, we grow food. And our smart ag tech company um, is working to put food uh, where food is needed most by using innovative approaches to solve food insecurity. So we all like to talk about this aquaponic cycle and uh, recreating root zone food webs. And all of us out here who have been working in the space for many years, think about how um, we've been doing this, but we haven't had very many people studying what we've done. Now, Ricosi and Dana Hare and all those guys uh, of the past and of the current, you know, Schultz and uh, many guys, Brooks, uh, but now we have a new generation of scientists who are actually, Steve has been able to capture, um, who are actually proving what, what I've been saying over time, that we not only uh, have uh, this, 
biomimicking uh, ecosystem and ecozones and a whole bunch of things happening, um, we actually are able to uh, do more than just grow food and grow uh, cannabis and a variety of other things. We're actually able to do some stuff in the uh, Terra area, so on the ground. So as we pro progress through our conversation today, um, Vic Victor is gonna come behind me and talk about his research um, and using um, aquaponics and his, uh, his systems. Um, and so uh, it's what you may see on the outside of many places um, is not what you're gonna necessarily see on the inside once you study it at the cellular uh, level. Um, so why aquaponics? We all uh, live and drink this. So um, this is a little bit about uh, what, what's special about what we do. Um, so kind of, uh, we have a highly aerated environment. We're now just seeing how um, people are starting to talk about micro bubbles and nano bubbles and so forth in our technology. We actually, uh, what we, we like to talk about is we've developed a soil water technology, which allows us to be able to have quicker uh, harvest times from seed to harvest times. Our filtration um, rates provide ideal growing methods and um, you know, there's a lot of uh, true triple bottom lines for the people, the profit, and the planet. So uh, when you're involved in the space of aquaponics, or uh, what we like to refer to as recirculating agriculture, you're actually able to do some stuff differently than many people. Now, my hydroponic friends, uh, we don't, we're not excluding you, but we want to talk about the fact that um, as we progress and move forward over time, we have to think about... Um, you know, the, uh, how are we using our solutions? Um, and let's think about that as we grow. Um, and so think about the uh, reduced drains on the water reserves. I mean, hell, California has been in trouble all season. And um, if you're looking at pushing yourself next to a, a, an old fish farm or a current fish farm, and you wanna grow food or cannabis, you might want to think about linking up with your uh, with your aquaponics and agriculture. Um, and, you know, depending upon which area you're in. If you're in fish, maybe you want to attach to somebody who's doing hydro. If you're in hydro, maybe you want to attach to somebody who's doing fish. Because as you hear in our talk a little bit as we move through this, I think you're going to find that um, people are really uh, looking at us to change the way in which food is grown. And, um, and our nutrition is moving forward, our medicine as we move forward. So um, this is kind of uh, the talk through our system and how we do it. So we all know that fish food is kind of along the crude protein. You know, we, these are the things that we have um, and uh, in our general fish food. And, you know, many times people are trying to figure out how are we able to get all the nutrition that the plants need, um, you know, because in hydroponic set setups, traditionally what we've done is, is we've had the formula for how we need to grow tomatoes, strawberries, lettuce, herbs, um, now cucumbers and peppers in the greenhouse setting, um, our controlled environment setting. Now, um, how are we able to take this fish food and grow all of those things in one space? Um, so I like to talk about the polycrop instead of the monocropping of the future because I think that's really how we're going to be able to do it as we move forward. So when you're feeding your fish, remember to, um, you wanna make sure that you're not overfeeding. And uh, in the situation that many of us use, we're using uh, tilapia or other herb, herb, you know, herb, herbivores. Um, and because it's traditionally coiled and several times longer than the entire length of the fish, it actually gives it um, you know, an opportunity for the, for the fish waste to be absorbed and, and moved out differently. And I like to talk about uh, what's happening in the reaction of the fish gut, um, which actually moves us forward as we uh, go forward into our aquaponic systems. So, um, you know, <clears throat> as I do my presentation from here forward, you're gonna find a lot of information that I have cited. Um, and I would encourage you to pay attention to these sites because the, um, this is where the science of proof is happening. This is no longer, we are no longer hobby growers. We are now, you know, aquaponics growers that are commercial. So then the bioreaction, we have the, you know, vortex clarifier. Almost everybody has that. 
And we're doing the enhanced biological uh, phosphorus removing um, the EBPRs, which allows for higher uh, influence for maximum efficiency. Um, and we use an anti-clockwise flow to move the solids into wasted sludge. So you can see here at the bottom, I'm talking about how the vortex settling basins and the other people who have gone through and done some of this um, research. So you can actually see, this is how we do it in our facility. So we have, how is RP moved? So everybody always wants to talk about nitrogen and um, the nitrogen in our system and how, you know, uh, aquaponics is that, you know, we've hijacked the nitrogen cycle, but have we thought about the other majors, the M, that we, had to, or that we want to talk about the Ns, let's talk about the Ps and the Ks. Um, so we're going to talk about the Ps today. Um, and so uh, in that, we're going to talk about um, uh, anaerobic, anoxic, aerobic, and uh, in our MBBRs, the moving bed bioreactor, we're going to talk about aerobic. So if you want to really look into that, that journal on, uh, at U Chicago, really help you talk, uh, think about more about the P. Now let's talk about why it's important. Um, you know, we only have about 30 years left of phosphorus in our environment to be able to uh, utilize for the ground farmers. Have you considered that maybe we could actually be the fertilizer producers of the future for the ground farmers so we can allow for carbon sequestration and a variety of other things happening? So I always want to start my conversation there because if we're really interested in making money, we need to think about how to diversify our facilities. We grow cannabis or we grow food, we grow fish, and we always have what I call the solid gold or the liquid gold. Um, and so it allows us to be able to, um, you know, do these things. But do you know how it happens? Do you know what this looks like? So why is the rhizosphere so important? Um, and uh, well, let me uh, get this video started for you so we can uh, see there. Can you guys see the video? No, um, uh, re-screen or re-share it, but when you do it, um, it'll have a, when you hit share screen, it'll have two check boxes. One of them will say optimize for video uh, and share sound. And then, uh, Is it doing it? Yeah. Steve, are we doing it? Can you mute the music? Yeah, it's all music right now. Can you uh, mute the music? Uh, thank you. Just sometimes I can flag the, the video. Uh, you're, you, you should be able to hear you uh, just fine, uh, uh, just not the, uh, the YouTube. I just wanted everyone to be able to see kind of uh, what's going on in the study um, with the protus and so why we're going to start talking about, um, you know, this, my, myself as well as Victor is going to be talking about this. Um, and, you know, I just wanted everyone to see that there's, there's a lot of information in the soil, it talks about the rhizome, but I want, you know, the rhizosphere, I want everyone to be paying attention to this because this is actually where we as growers can really change, um, you know, the health and, and wealth of our facilities. Um, and this is a food safety concern. So um, I'm gonna stop the share of that and go back to the share of my presentation. All right, are we back there? So this yep. is the, this is the area that I you know I I made my my name in food safety and 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 uh, and and you know developing facilities that were food safe and commercial, you know. Um, but I think really coming from the background of where are we for the future, the plant level and 
other areas are really where we need to be talking about these days. So we know system design. We have people who can design systems for you. We know controlled environment facilities. There's been a lot of money put into those facilities. We know how to grow, but now let's optimize and get the best we can for our plants and um, what's happening there. So let's talk about the probiotics of plants. I know Steve loves to talk about this. Um, and so uh, the PAOs that allow the plants to always eat, the phosphate, uh, the PSMs and the PSBs. Um, and if you're interested in you know, more information on this, you know, I think Steve's probably gonna let you be able to utilize my uh, slideshow and it's certainly okay for me. Um, but look at this uh, online uh, information um, that you can find. These are all uh, you know, research-based um, empirical uh, data uh, level uh, uh, research studies that have been done. So let's talk about PSBs. Phosphate is a major macronutrient for biological growth and development. So organic forms of phosphorus range from about 30 to 50% in most soils, yet here we are in our water and we can actually get quite a bit, sometimes 60 to 80% more than soils, which is why this is the science behind why our plants grow. And I know Victor may or may not talk today about the, the lives of plants and how they actually choose um, how they grow and what they grow. And this is the area where we have not spent a lot of time, although there has been a lot of time spent in this in wastewater treatment. So if you think about as you're building and designing your facilities and you wanna optimize, look to the wastewater treatment facilities and then go back to your fish and what your fish are providing. And then look, starting at fish feed and going forward, you will be able to find the stream that you're needing to be able to get the bacteria you're trying to develop, such as we have developed with our soil water. Over the years, we're looking at 10 years of development of the soil water that we have in our facility that we can put in most people's facilities and it will hijack and, and superstart the, uh, the systems that you're trying to get to grow immediately. So the other thing I like to talk about is the PGPMs, the plant growth uh, promoting microorganisms. This is going to be the research of the future. Um, the aquaponics PGPM uh, microbial root colonization is really going to be where science goes in the future. And I think that you'll be able to take pictures and look at that. And it's also going to allow us to, the reason why it matters is that so many people are chasing their butts with putting in supplements into their aquaponics facilities. It's, and if they're running a RAS, the thing that concerns me, and if I come into your facility and have to run a HACCP or a, um, you know, some sort of food safety audit, I'm really going to be looking at what your nutrient supplementation are. I know here in the state of Florida, I'm gonna, you know, we're commercial growers here, and we have to, in our BMP plans now, put even though we're indoors and even though we don't even put anything out into the environment or on the ground or into the water uh, systems, we still have to properly document the nutrient supplementation that we do. So we in our facilities make a habit of not really using, you know, uh, nutrient supplementation. Now, in some places, you know, you're going to have some iron issues, you're going to have some other issues, so you're going to have to do a bit of supplements. But if you guys are trying to, you know, run down your pH um, with, you know, a variety of, of things, then you're going to, you know, you're going to have to pay attention to that on your food safety levels. Um, and there's going to be, you're going to see more kind of stringent uh, information on this because of the fact that we are you know, low on water as well as we have other issues. So we have to be super careful about how we uh, supplement our facilities, especially if you're running rafts. Now we're running over in our facility in East Palatka, a decoupled system, but, and it, so our water doesn't, re, you know, it doesn't return back to the fish and we run cycles within each system. Um, but you really need to pay attention to how you're supplementing and um, you know, how your plants are doing with these supplements. So really, what does this mean? It means our plants grow faster because the nutrients are always available. I'm sure all of you can do testimonials to how fast, much faster your plants grow compared to, you know, if you've been a grower of the past, um, say you uh, were maybe a ground grower or you did drip irrigation or something like that. You can always, I always hear people talk about 
oh, well, I grow faster in aquaponics. And we know why it's available is because the channels are always open and allows us to be able to, um, you know, for the bacteria and everything that are transitioning uh, everything to be able to actually um, feed and the plants to feed at all times. Our effluent allows us to clean up pollutants when emitted onto the ground. This is a thing that is really, um, we've been paying a lot of attention to in our facilities um, because, you know, we build, we like to build on brownfields because we don't use the, we use the ground. And so what we've been trying to do is, is push uh, our effluent onto the grounds to be able to grow. You know, like uh, we're involved with the Yopon brothers, Yopon, um, you know, uh, holly trees and uh, stuff like that where they're not necessarily plants that don't go through a kill step before people ingest them. Um, so there's a variety of ways in which you could clean up pollutants in your environment by allowing your effluent to go on there because it actually builds the microbes of the soil because we have this very nutritious effluent coming out. So we as recirculating agriculture uh, professionals have to uh, have an adaptive, um, you know, grow on the ground because we have developed, you know, these systems that allows uh, many nutrients to grow, not only inside of our greenhouses, inside of our controlled environment facilities, but I'm also, um, I'm also encouraging you to hook up with farmers near you and, you know, sell your products, your effluent to them because over time, the phosphorus that is available in that situation allows them to spend less on synthetic, synthetic chemicals as we move forward into our future. So these are the citations um, that are uh, around um, some of the things that you know, we've been doing. Um, and I like to leave you with the fact that, remember, if one of us fails, all of us fails. And so you need to, we have already considered, we know we've spent many years on, does the system work? Yes, we know the system work. Now the question is, does, the next question was, is my system better than yours? I mean, I can tell you aquaponics conference after aquaponics conference for years, people were fighting over system design. Was it, should it be in totes? Should it be in reactors? How should it be? We know that in aquaponics, we can grow pretty much in any environment. So we figured this out. The place, the, the new frontiers will be in the water that is below the plants and the things that you do with the, what I like to refer to as the soil water below the plants. So uh, that's my talk today, uh, Steve. I wanted to uh, stop there and uh, have some dialogue because I know Victor's coming behind me. I don't wanna uh, you know, talk too much about what he's going to talk about because he's talking a lot about PAOs and how PAOs are really the new frontier and what we should be paying attention to as aquaponics uh, farmers. So what, um, what are some of the different uh, probiotics that you have worked with uh, as far as um, uh, in the aquatic realm? I know I'm a, a big proponent of lactobacillus. What have you had uh, positive experiences with? Well, I'm unmuted now. Um, lactobacillus is, is really the, the start. You know, um, we were talking about uh, when Victor comes on, he may, I, I think he may talk about the dandelion um, uh, work that he's been doing for iron. You know, there's everything that we need um, in this space. I'm not answering your question, Steve, but I am going to in a roundabout way. Um, in this space, we can actually uh, develop the, uh, the probiotics and, and a variety of other things in our systems. Now, what I like to talk about is, is we start with, with the lactobacillus, but we go into some other things that um, if you aren't careful, you know, can lead you to other issues. But if you develop them correctly, you have proper aeration, um, you know, you can, you can do pretty well. I'm having a slag in my, bear with me. No worries. Let me uh, see what's going on on here on chat. Um, what are, what are some of the common issues that you're seeing as far as pests? You get a chance to go to a lot of different um, 
different types of facilities. What are some of the most common that you're seeing uh, in your work or over the years with uh, aquaponics? What have been the, the dominant pests that you've observed? Um, I want to re refer to kind of go back to um, uh, your first question. Um, I think some of the pseudomonas, uh, you're going to hear uh, the, uh, some of the other guys talk about the enterococcus and some of those other things as far as in the probiotic space. Um, bacillus, um, there's a variety of other things that we're talking about in our facilities that we're looking at. Um, and with the, in the PAO um, spectrum, I didn't list them all. Um, and that's, you know, I'm sorry about that. Um, but the, in the PAO uh, and the PSBs, um, we're finding that uh, we're, we're getting some interesting stuff. So, you know, um, one of the things that I want us to be thinking about is um, mycorrhiza. And so how are we developing those in our systems? And so um, I've been looking, that's kind of where my next place is um, in looking is in that space. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all sorts of probiotics that, um, you know, people are, are doing and utilizing. I mean, if you talk in the, the growth promoter space, you're going to hear people talk about you know, the, uh, the lactobacillus, of course, and then you're gonna hear the uh, ultramonas, um, you know, a variety of, of things that, that people are talking about. But I think that, Steve, I think you're onto something with the lactobacillus and the bacillus, period. Um, so um, going back to your other question, I'm just catching up, so I apologize. It appears as though I'm delayed. So the next question you asked was, what are you seeing as far as pest? So we see the traditional things that people see everywhere. You know, you're seeing white flies, <clears throat> army worms. Um, we're seeing a whole variety of, you know, um, leaf, um, leaf kind of uh, plant. Um, we see also some stuff that happens below the zone um, that we we don't have, but we've seen them in other places with uh, downy and a uh, variety of um, other things that, that are really sometimes new um, to us because we, we have either a too moist of environment or we have a too dry environment. Um, you'll see, uh, you see in lettuce, we see rust um, and um, you know, we're just, we, we see all the same things that everyone else sees. It's the situation is, is that we have to be super careful about how we deal with those. So what we've done in our facility, Steve, is, is we've gone to biosecurity and physical controls. So we're putting dog houses on our facilities. We're doing the uh, fan blowing. Um, as you come through our facilities, you wash your feet in a, um, you know, foot bath. And then from the foot back, you're going to enter into a uh, sticky, sticky pad area where you kind of wipe off your shoes before you actually reach our plants. And the other thing that's super important that people aren't paying attention to is um, the manner and path for which your employees as well as your visitors are walking in your facility. Super important. It's a super important way and uh, thought in which to um, be thinking about uh, how we move forward. What are some of the biggest uh, or most common mistakes you see in biosecurity? I know you're definitely uh, an area, it's definitely an area uh, of expertise uh, that you know more than most. Oh man, I have to tell you, I cringe every time I get a Hort Daily or an uh, MMJ Daily and I see people holding their whatever it is with their bare hands in their super controlled environment. Um, and they don't have they don't have just basic, um, so you know it's a, it's apparent to me that their SOPs are not fully in place because they are, you know they don't uh, in a in a cannabis facility. I think since we are spending so much time and money in those facilities, I think you should have your employees change their clothes or have some sort of uniform, um, and that is important because of. A variety of reasons and I, the reason is is I want everyone in cannabis to succeed and I know that what is going to happen is is the uh, FDA and USDA are going to start once they legalize cannabis 
you're going to become, everybody's going to focus on you. So in ramping up on that, instead of being cavalier as we have traditionally been in aquaponics and then uh, cannabis growing, let's embrace the rules at the beginning and let's build our facilities and walk through our facilities and do our facilities so that we can not have any biosecurity issues. So here are some of the things and places where I see biosecurity issues. So I go to a facility and they, uh, I'm there for an audit and I walk in and they don't have me sign in. They don't have me, um, they don't look at what I'm like, if I have on a jacket or any things that I'm bringing in. Um, when I enter their facility, if I'm entering their mother rooms or, you know, a variety of other things, what do I have on my person that could possibly cause contamination issues? Basically, it's the human factor that I see in biosecurity. The other thing is, is please keep your animals out of our facilities. Um, please do not have your, your, your puppy come to check on your facility on Saturday and walk through the facility with you. It is not okay. If you have animals on your facility, um, you need to have a biosecurity plan for that. How are you washing your shoes? Are you changing your shoes? Um, you know, in cannabis facilities, like I was in one in Carbondale, Illinois. And when I entered, I was in Fort Knox. I mean, I had to go through a gate. They scanned me. They, they scanned my body. They scanned my body in and they scanned my body out. Yet they didn't look, you know, at my shoes. They didn't offer me different shoes. They didn't offer me booties. We, could, they walk, we walked through and they, the grower took and would turn the plant over and say, see the sap? See this? See that? Okay. Those are not, you shouldn't be, that's not really okay. Um, I know that it's, man, it's just beautiful and we're just walking through there and your hands are clean, but just put on your gloves. Um, what, um, let me see here. Um, have you had any other or maybe negative experiences with any um, of these uh, microbial additives uh, or uh, especially? Yeah, you can add too many. And then you, you, you get, you know, some <laughs> adverse. And now the other thing you need to keep in mind is, is that when you start talking about probiotics, you're going to have some people who are in the space of, oh, that's going to make people sick. Um, and so you have to get down to the, you know, species, not the genus, the species of what you're using so that there is an informed decision about how you are, what you are doing and how you are doing it. Um, you know, there is in the, in the phosphorus range, you can actually, you know, a uh, bacteria, you can actually hear people will start, oh, that's going to make people sick. No, you have to get to the species, get to the species that we're developing. And so you're going to need to have work with someone. And this is actually you know, future opportunities for people to make money is in that space, which I think Victor's probably going to talk to you about. There's two areas we're going to make money. And your previous guy was just talking about that seeds, seeds for certain types of grows and the bacteria and other things below the plants. Those are the two areas of research where we need to be spending more time. And I can tell you that every university in, in the country that I'm dealing with is in the, what can we do in the CEA space? Because I know cannabis is, is what we're talking about today, but brothers and sisters in growing, food is going to be a problem going forward because we have climate change issues and we have to adjust for them. And the manner in which we adjust for them depends on our shoulders. It is on our shoulders for us to be able to do something different. We are on the bleeding edge of something that could be revolutionary for how our brothers and sisters and communities eat, smoke, drink, and a whole variety of other things. Uh, so say someone's an experienced cannabis grower, they're, wanna get it, or they're doing aquaponics or they wanna get into aquaponics and they wanna grow some vegetables as well on scale. Uh, you have a lot of experience growing lots of different ones. What are some of the best ones that they should consider to start off with if they're trying to move into that space uh, and diversify into food? Okay, so this is my favorite question because I, I, I read this week about the Canadian cannabis growers. Man, I, I just with a sad, sore heart have just looked at their stuff and thought, okay, what can we do to keep these guys going? Here's my suggestion. 
play into the market of what you need. Every market in the world has somebody counting what people are eating. In, a, in the United States, it's the AMS. We know what trucks move in and out. We know how much is being utilized, what is being eaten in the grocery stores, and what is in Slack. I think that if you want to think about growing and you have Dutch bucket or you have other things that you can grow, um, utilizing the materials that you already have in the cannabis space, I would strongly suggest that you look into the, I know it's tomato market. You could look into the uh, indoor fruits. I think indoor grown fruits are going to be the, the wave of the future. Um, because we can control so much and we are, as cannabis or as aquaponics growers, we provide the a full component of the microbes that are needed um, for the plants to do very well. Um, I think that, you know, you could go into that space, depending upon how much space you have, time you've spent, <coughs> you could capture a whole variety of markets. Heck, I'm saying just go ahead and grow, um, utilizing, um, do a polycrop and see what, you know, what your locals want to buy. I'm telling you, you guys can make some money. If, if I had growers locally with me right now, we don't have, uh, we have a lack of uh, romaine. We have a lack of cucumber. We have a lack of zucchini. All these things can be grown um, indoors. We can grow celery indoors. We can grow beets. <coughs> lots and lots of things can be grown. You just have to decide what it is that you're going to sell because it's hobby if you're only growing it to just have fun and hang out at the farmer's market. But if you want to grow it and make money and sell it to the, to the larger market, then give me a call. Uh, what are some other uh, higher value crops that you've seen people have success with uh, aside from cannabis uh, utilizing aquaponics? Well, I think that there is other medicinal opportunities. Wild daga. Um, <coughs> you know, you could grow celery. If you look at the market and celery market, um, a couple weeks ago, a box of 24S celery was going for like 40 bucks. On a hole for celery, uh, the hole spacing for celery is on um, six or eight inch centers. You can line them up side by side. It takes 90 days, but you could do some other crop in the meantime. I, I think that you need to, if we look, if you go to your markets and look to see what is not there, look and see what's on the import. You know, I had, has, has everyone else paid attention to the fact of what they don't have in the grocery store? Is there any um, uh, pest management um, uh, controls that you would uh, recommend or maybe steer people against that are commonly uh, recommended? Steve, can you ask me that question again? No worries. Um, is there any um, uh, pest management um, uh, things that are maybe thought of as more natural or organic that you would m maybe steer people away from? Uh, and then is there any ones that you maybe uh, would recommend to people that they might not have heard of? Oh, Steve, in our talk, remember we did the potent ponics conversation? We talked about this at long length. Um, you know, people uh, oftentimes when they're, if they're growers and they're, They've been growing maybe in controlled environment hydroponically. <coughs> they find that they think that they can use some of those chemicals. Because we have fish, we cannot. And so I'd like to say to you, if you do your biosecurities correctly and you manage your people and your movement, the pest suppression is natural. Now, you know that I am the, the queen of planting stuff all around my facilities to rid uh, and eliminate, draw bugs to those things instead of, you know, to our greenhouses. So we scrape, you know, when we build the grounds, we build our grounds up um, eight inches above uh, the 100 year flood plain and we pitch them. So that gives us an opportunity to be able to, to do biosecurity. So for instance, um, in our facilities, we build, uh, when we do the knee walls of our greenhouses, we put the knee walls down about 12 to 18 inches. Um, 
you know, so 30, 33 centimeters to 50 centimeters into the ground uh, is our plastics. Because, you know, you get fish, you get some stuff that uh, bugs like or, or animals like, they're going to dig underneath. So, you know, it's little bitty biosecurity things like that. Now, what you were asking me is, are there, um, you know, dipels of the world and a variety of other things that we want to talk about? It just depends upon your, A, your environment, your crop, your harvest, your market, what are they requiring? Because sometimes I notice that when I have, um, I have somebody pound or uh, hammer um, and pounded um, cannabis for, to get into the lab, I'm having problems with uh, heavy metals. So we're needing to pay attention to that because the ways in which we are uh, dealing with our, uh, our products have to be, we have to really think about, okay, we wanna not have that bug or that pest or that this or that, but you also have to think about the end result. So the end result is the most important thing that you're, I would like to talk about as far as food, you know, biosecurity and food safety. Um, you know, we talked about the human factor, but now let's talk about the plant factor. So if you're gonna talk about the plant factor, we have to consider what you're adding below and what you're spraying on top. And you know, this, in the, in the CBD realm, people are talking about putting the Delta-8 and all that, a variety of those kinds of things. I want to be careful about how we are doing that. Um, so I, more so less pest I that I like to talk about than the food safety concerns of what you're adding to eliminate pest or to get your product to where you want it to be for the market. Yeah, it was definitely a concern. Uh, I know we saw a big issue with that. And um, it was a mega... Uh, uh, Vitamin E. Uh, people are putting vitamin E on smokable products, which is definitely a no-no uh, to try and increase the bioavailability. And while it will absolutely help with uptake through your skin, uh, it, it is very bad for your lungs. So uh, we certainly see those issues. Um, someone had a great question in chat about fish. Um, what types of fish do you recommend? And have you seen different um, uh, types of fish work better for flowering crops versus leafy greens? You know, I want poop. All I care about is poop. So that's all we really. So uh, one of the things that uh, in aquaponics that people have, you know, really not paid attention to is the um, opportunity to make money in fish. And so um, at our facilities, we're uh, currently running, you know, we run tilapia, we're fixing to put in shrimp, um, and then we a uh, hybrid striped bass. And so we know that these uh, varieties work very well. We've seen catfish. We've seen, obviously, the big aquaponics facilities up north have grown salmon. Um, but, you know, I built a facility for the Omni Amelia Island Plantation. And um, he had, uh, he was, he was, <laughs> he was a chef. He's a great chef. And he had, he trained all of these chefs um, in his in, in how to deal with the aquaponic system. And on a regular basis, they would call me and say, um, we need more fish or we've overrun our tanks. And the <coughs> benefit to that was that they were having amazing tomato and strawberry crops. And the irony was, is that those were literally right outside the facilities where the water was running. And so to answer your question, uh, that's my, my kind of parable to you is, is that he's running this water and what he grew were red-breasted sunfish. So for the small growers who have this, there's an interest in this market of what can I get locally? Can I, get, can I find a, you know, because you can almost always find a fish hatchery, somebody locally growing the, the red-breasted sunfish or brim. Um, some people refer to them. Um, they do fine in our tanks. Stump knockers. If you have a, a situation where you have snails, get yourself some stump knockers, as they call them, so they can eat. So I have not really found any issues with people not being able to grow goldfish, koi, 
uh, tilapia, um, hyperstripe bass, um, catfish, shrimp. Um, the interesting thing is, is uh, what we're able to do bringing up the uh, salinity. So as we pro progress through a more salty world, what fish can we grow aquaponically and what foods and so forth can we grow? I think it would be very interesting to see if there's somebody out there who wants to utilize a saltier system and grow something, you know, that's in a, requires a saltier environment and be able to sell those fish to the markets. Well, traditionally, um, uh, a lot of your brassicas have been fairly salt tolerant. I know uh, there's definitely, I read some papers on it being tied to microbial populations as well, uh, assisting with salt tolerance. So it's definitely another area circling back to your original uh, uh, topic there of microbes and bacteria. Um, uh, yeah. I, I it's think actually it's my belief that if we get the bacteria right, it doesn't matter what the majority, because, you know, the solution for issues is dilution. You know, that's my favorite thing to say is, is if you need a, if you have a problem, dilute it. Um, you know, it's a historic lab issue. The solution, you know, is in dilution. And so, um, you know, many people are trying, I think in a, for a decoupled system, it's super, super simple to be able to run a saltier, you know, higher chloride system uh, using the, you know, MBBRs and so forth. I mean, we can use those in marine systems, do them all the time. And um, in the marine environment, you could grow a whole, heck, we could, some of this could probably stock the ocean um, and make money in a, in a, not only in the cannabis and food space, but in the actual, you know, protein space of growing high quality indoor land-based, um, what we consider sea fish. Um, I mean, we've been able to grow snook. Uh, we've, we've, in my, earlier before I started, you know, before I began Traders Hill, I was working in the marine environment and we were able to grow all sorts of things in the marine environment and we were growing um, you know, lawn plants in that setting. So, I mean, just think about the fact that you don't have to um, always grow food in these environments. You could grow other things, ornamentals and, you know, other stuff. Awesome. Uh, we had another question from chat. Um, have you tried different types of shrimp or other invertebrates? And what type of issues have you run into uh, growing invertebrates with aquaponics? Um, if you're, <laughs> you know what happens when shrimps get alarmed? When they get afraid? Do you know what they do? They jump. So you must manage for this. The other thing is, is they are, they are very territorial and you have to be careful about your spacing. So you need to be thinking about that as you move forward. Now, down the road from me in East Palatka, there was a guy who was doing the Australian um, crawfish. And, you know, the blue, um, he was doing the crayfish, crawfish, however you say it. Um, and he had really good success um, in growing. Uh, he grew nightshades and um, other things. He did a polycrop as well. And so we've seen, I, with my own two eyes, I've seen shrimp <clears throat> and um, the, um, the, the crawfish. Uh, we got another question. Um, is there an easy way to increase protists in your system or rhizosphere? Yeah, you, your environment. Um, I think that you need to be, you need to reduce the amount of, um, first of all, Let's talk about where your water comes from. So well, that's where I really think that the majority of people uh, sometimes are killing off their bacteria because they have city or well, you know, their water is going through a chlorination. <coughs> Many people like to have, you know, fancy reverse osmosis DI systems in there in, in the place. And I think sometimes you kill off the bacteria that you're seeking in that. So I would say, get the water that you have out of your well, get it tested, and then try to encourage your protus, um, depending upon what you're trying to develop. If you need to develop ones that, um, depending upon the plant types. So what we're going to see in this bacteria thing 
are the uh, your protists and your uh, these other bacteria, fungi, all these other important um, microbiome uh, situations. I think what you're going to find is, is that if you're in a cold weather environment, you're going to have these. If you're in a warm weather environment, you're going to have these. If you're in, you know, in between, it's going to be this. Or if you're in control, you can have this sort of situation. So it's just like when we were in, when I was in the lab, when I worked, you know, many years ago, um, and, and I would work in the lab. Every, depending upon the produce that you're trying to, you know, develop depends upon what you're going to do. Um, and I think the most important <laughs> thing, you guys are going to scowl at me, has to do with hygiene. If you have biofilms that do not lend for your produce to develop because you do not have a good hygiene process, you will then have anoxic and you will have some other issues that you do not want in your systems. So it's, I always bring everything back to food safety and biosecurity because... It's important that if you want to develop these things to help you grow better, that you keep a clean system. Um, so, you know, how do they develop? It's important. It, you know, it's there. They have been developing. I mean, we started with red algae is, you know, is your first one. And then you're, so these are million, billion years old and they adapt. You know, they're, they're a very diverse collection. They're not just one type. Um, it depends upon what you need coming out of your water. And so if your water isn't, it doesn't have certain things and you're trying to develop these other ones, you need to kind of have the environment for them to develop. So there are certain things that do not like light. I notice many people uh, in their totes are clear and they get this algae buildup. So, um, you know, there's... Uh, you know, there's a whole variety of, um, you know, things that you must do to keep that, that right. Um, so I just want you, to, you guys to think about keeping your systems clean. Don't add as too many products. Um, and um, from there, you want to uh, really pay attention to, you know, the films that are developing now. Uh, if you have, in the la this is my going to be one of my last few things I tell you. When you have your inspector come in to visit you and you start talking about your bioflock or your uh, bioreactors and this sort of thing, they're going to freak out, okay? What you have in your facility is a fertilizer maker with your fish. And you can talk about in, that, in this area, we have the transitioning of the NPKs. Talk their talk. Win this game, folks. Remember, if one of us fails, all of us fails. If you don't know, it's okay. Ask someone. We will help you because we all want, to, want you to win. And so if you keep your place clean, you document everything you do, you do what you say, you say what you do, and then you prove it in your documentation and in your growth, you'll have no worries. So that's my last bit of pep talk to the uh, masses. Let's do this, brothers and sisters. We can feed and grow for the masses. We can change the world with our way of growing. We can get us back a couple degrees lower and get us back where we need to go. How do people find out more about you? Uh, you can uh, go to worldwideaquaponics.org. You can follow me on Instagram. We have uh, work all over the world. We have our uh, sister growing over in the, in the Czech Republic, uh, grow gardens in the Czech Republic. We have uh, facilities starting up in South America. We have uh, fellow farmers in uh, Hansville, Washington, Selbyville, Delaware, all over the state of Florida, uh, as well as in Texas and a variety of other places. Now, Victor's gonna come next. And he's going to tell you the deep, deep secrets of the PAOs from his research. You want to pay attention to what he's telling you and see if you can develop what you need in your facilities to be able to grow faster, better, cleaner for the future. Awesome.
Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and educate us on these uh, topics that people often don't get a chance to. Uh, certainly, if people are, are needing help or, or you know, auditing their place, definitely reach out to Angela. Uh, she is uh, one of the best in the business uh, as far as making sure that you're on point and you're going to make it through all those inspections and things. She's uh, one of the best. That's why we love to have her uh, speak with us. Hey, thanks, guys. We always appreciate it. You know, um, the... Uh... The interesting thing is, is that uh, as we move to a more uh, legalized space, I think our facilities will, be ha will have to come full circle and be able to grow uh, multiple things. Um, so um, let's just keep this moving and uh, reach out to people um, and uh, keep it growing. You don't know what you don't know until you don't know. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. And... Uh... Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'll talk soon.